All right. We have just sang my first scripture reading. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And our second scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verse 21 and 22. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. This morning, I want to talk about the continuing threat of andeism. The word antiism is not found in the dictionary, but the word anti is found and defined as an adjective, which means opposed to a given proposal, policy, or so forth. The word means being against something. There are many words with the prefix anti in the Bible, such as the antichrist, meaning somebody that is opposed to Christ, we find the usage in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and verse 22, also again in chapter 4 and verse 3, and then also 2 John 9. Anti-Christian, anti-slavery, anti-biblical, these are all uses of the word anti. In the religious realm, two words are often used with opposite meanings, namely liberalism and antiism. These words mean going to an extreme, either to the right or to the left of the truth of God's word. Jehovah commanded Joshua, the new leader who took the place of Moses following his death, to be strong and of good courage that thou might observe to do according to all the law. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left hand. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And so there's a, this principle of antiism and liberalism is a Bible concept. Liberalism is going beyond God's word and adding to it. 2 John 9, whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Whereas antiism is making laws where God uh, has not made a law and opposing that which the Lord allows. A simple illustration of both extremes would be that uh, of driving a car on the road, there's a ditch on both sides to the right hand and to the left. To go off the road on either side is dangerous and could cause a fatal accident. Of course, the church has always had her problems with teaching strict obedience to God's uh, will in all things. This is true in the early days of the church, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 34, Galatians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. It is likewise true today. Swinging from extreme side of liberalism, going beyond God's word in certain things. In other words, the liberal will allow what God forbids. Some have gone, after, as they left that idea of liberalism, some have gone to the extreme right side and have ended up in antiism or radicalism, as some might term it. Making men's opinions and customs equal and binding as the scriptures. As is always true, the tendency of a reaction to go too far, whether it be the extreme of liberalism or antiism or conservatism. We must be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks a question regarding our faith and practice. In this lesson, we will notice some examples of antiism uh, in the body of Christ and its harmful effects. But first, we need to note who is the head of the church and who has all authority. Scriptures emphasize that the Lord's church is the called out or the saved. See that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, and that Christ has all authority. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus claims to have all authority. In fact, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He didn't say some authority. He said all authority. And so all authority in, in matters of life and religion and work and service to God, worship.
The authority lies in Jesus Christ. As such, Jesus is the only head of the church, which is his body, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Also, the church is to be subject unto Christ, Ephesians 5, verse 23 and 24, in all things. According to his divinely revealed will in the New Testament, John 16, verse 13, Jude 3, Revelation 22, verse by and promote. Our teaching and preaching is authorized only to the extent that it is supported by a proper use of the sacred scriptures. It's easy for false teachers to come into a congregation and persuade some members to believe and practice things that are contrary to the will of Christ. This happens to some of the brethren in Galatia, according to Paul's language, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of God, unto another gospel, which is not another, but some would have troubled you and would pervert the gospel, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. So whatever we do in word or deed, we need to do all in the name of the Lord or by his authority. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Now we need to note some things about God's commands and antiism. We need to talk about generic and specific commands. The Lord's commands are both generic and specific. A, gene a generic or general command is one that authorizes a certain action but does not give the details on how that command is to be carried out or obeyed. A specific commandment is uh, one that not only authorizes a certain action but also gives the details on how that command is to be carried out. Furthermore, a commandment may be mixed, that is, partially generic and partially specific. Let's look at some examples. God told Noah to build an ark, and you've probably heard this one before, specifying the dimensions, the kind of wood to use, how many windows, how many doors, how many floors, out. He told all the details. Noah built the ark according to the Lord's directions, Hebrews 11 and verse 7. He, be, he obeyed God. Now, had God said to build the ark out of wood, generic, any kind of wood would have been acceptable. However, since the Lord specified go for wood, it would have been or some other wood in addition to gopher wood. However, the command to build the ark of gopher wood, according to the dimensions, included any tool such as a hammer or an axe or a saw, means for transporting the wood from the forest to the location. Noah's convenience for building the ark, a commandment authorizing everything essential to obeying that command, Therefore, God's command to Noah was generic in reference to the tools used to the, in the construction of the ark, but specific in reference to the kind of wood that he was to use. Regarding the tools, he could use any kind of tools that would help him accomplish the task. Regarding the wood, he was limited by the specific command to use Go for wood. Moreover, the Lord teaches by three message, uh, three methods. Number one, by direct command or direct statement, approved apostolic example, necessary inference. To illustrate, repentance is a command, Acts 17 and verse 30, Luke 13 and verse 3. To eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week is an approved apostolic example that we get from Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Since Jesus came up out of water at his baptism, Mark 1 and verse 10, it is necessarily uh, inference to say that he first went down into the water. Acts 8 verse 36 and 39 and Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Now let's look at some examples 
of anteism. With this background study, we are better prepared to note some examples of anteism among believers in Christ. Probably going back the furthest is anti-Sunday school or divided classes, either before or after the regular general worship assembly. And giving what is commonly called the Great Commission, Christ gave to his disciples four commands. Go, teach, baptize, and then teach the baptized. That's found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. As you go or, or go into all the world, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. These are all generic commands. The word go is generic with respect to the means of travel to be used. One can go by walking or riding. If he rides, uh, he can use a donkey, a boat, a car, a train, or a plane. He can use any means available to him that seems expedient for that part is optional. In fact, a way of travel may be scripturally right, but not expedient. You know, in Acts chapter 38, in, or, or, uh, Paul was I'm sorry, Acts chapter 27 and 28, Paul's traveling to Rome. He's going by boat and he gets to one harbor and he says, it's not a good season to continue. And so even though he is authorized by traveling by boat, it wasn't expedient because the weather was going to get bad. In fact, they ignored his, his warning. They traveled anyway and they became shipwrecked. All should carefully mark the difference between the essentials and the incidentals. The Lord did not specify as to how the teaching of the gospel was to be done. The gospel must be preached. That is the essential thing. The way of teaching or preaching in small groups or large audiences, publicly or privately, in classes arranged by age groups, by oral or written means, by radio or television, are purely optional. Various ways were used in the apostolic day. The Sunday morning class method of teaching comes under the command, the general command to teach. But it's not only general, but it's generic. We're just told to teach. We're not told what method to use. The method has to be determined by expediency. The anti-Bible school or Sunday school faction is an example of brethren treating a matter of opinion as a matter of obligation. And this resulted in the division of the body of Christ. We just took communion. We used multiple cups. Another anti-position is one cup. Anti-individual cups in observance of the Lord's Supper. The command to assemble and worship God is found in passages such as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, Acts 20 and verse 7. Yet the Lord does not specify the kind of place or the hour of the assembly. No one is authorized by Jehovah God to make a law to tell Christians where to meet in order to worship or at what hour on the first day of the week. In other words, the congregation here at Fish Hatchery Road doesn't have a right to tell any other congregation that they have to meet for worship at 10 o'clock. Nor do we have the right to say that they have to come here to do it. Other congregations can decide where and when they're going to worship. The very command to assemble for worship authorizes some place and some hour for the meeting in worship, the partaking of the cup, which is the fruit of the vine or grape juice. It's plainly spelled out for us that way by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 and following. Also, Paul repeats that in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25. It's not unscriptural to take the cup the fruit of the vine, out of one vessel, although it might not be sanitary, therefore not expedient. Neither is it unscriptural to take the fruit of the vine out of several containers. 
The number of containers used would depend, of course, upon the size of the congregation. But to say the cup must be taken out of one container and only one by the whole congregation is to make a human law where God has not made one. In the communion, one does not take partake of a literal cup or container, whether it be glass, a mug, but of the contents, which is the fruit of the vine. And in that sense, there is only one cup. <clears throat> orphans homes anti-orphan homes for the and homes for the ages to help care for the orphans and the elderly there are people that are opposed to that anti-orphan home anti-home for the aged and yet James wrote pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fathers and widows in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's James 1 in verse 27. That's what James says is pure and undefiled religion. Can the church practice pure and undefiled religion? If so, then the church is obligated to care for widows and orphans and to keep itself unspotted from the world. The early church assisted in those needs. We see this in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, where the Grecian widows were taken care of. Also in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 20, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16. Helping the needy is a matter of faith, and, and how to do this work is in the realm of human judgment. The Bible just says to help, but it doesn't say how. Since there are no specific detailed methods outlined in the New Testament, God has given freedom to choose man's own method for doing benevolence. The means and methods of cares for orphans and widows, the aged, so forth, are optional for the local congregation. Some use James chapter 1 and verse 22 seven to teach that the church cannot in any way support orphans in what is called an orphan's home that the scriptural way to care for orphans and widows is each individual taken to his private home orphans now it's not wrong for christians to do that to take in widows. And by the way, I've known a lot of people that hold the anti-position on these issues, on this issue in particular, that have adopted orphan children. But I've yet to see any that have adopted elderly widows and taken them into their home. So they're just obeying. I guess they're just half pure. Their religion is just half pure. It's not wrong to do that. But is it expedient? Could we supply the needs of many children and elderly if we pool our resources and fund those efforts from the church? Remember, this is a generic command. We've been given the general command to help, to support uh, widows and orphans, but we haven't been told how. So it's not wrong for Christians to take widows and orphans into their home, but it's wrong to say that this is the only way such benevolent must be done. Romans 15, 25 through 27, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Anti-church cooperation in doing evangelistic work for spreading the gospel. I have known this to be so bad that there was a television program and there were two congregations in the same town that were broadcasting a live television program. There was an Andy congregation that was on first, and then there was another congregation that held the truth on the issue. Now the guy that came second was going to use a chalkboard and he forgot his chalk, knowing that the anti brother used a chalkboard as well, asked if he could borrow some chalk from the anti brother. 
that didn't believe that one church can help support another church in this preaching of the gospel, and he wouldn't even give him a piece of chalk to write on the chalkboard. Think about that. Every church has a work to do in proclaiming the good news of man's salvation to the whole world. We see this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. We talked about that. Mark 16, 15 and 16. The Great Commission according to Mark. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. In the execution of this general command, when no specific methods are bound, each congregation is left free under God to make his own choices in the message used to expedite the command. The elders of the church have the oversight of the work of that congregation in matters of judgment can make necessary decisions for accomplishing the Lord's will. Elders do not have charge of two or more congregations, only one. Acts 14 and verse 23. They appointed elders in every church. Since this is true, any organization larger or smaller than the local church is without scriptural authority. However, the scriptures teach that another congregation or churches may of their own free will give assistance to a church to aid in the accomplishment of the work of preaching the gospel. And in any specific, scripturally authorized work, churches cooperate during the apostolic times in preaching the gospel. The church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch in Syria to help this young congregation, Acts chapter 11, verse 22 and 24. Church in Antioch later sent out Paul, Barnabas, John, Mark on their first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. The church at Antioch also sent out Paul on his second and third missionary journeys. And on, this, on these journeys, other congregations at times helped to support him. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8. After several years of traveling and preaching, Paul addressed the good uh, church at Philippi with these commendable words concerning his preaching and the help that they had given him. He said, How ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. This surely implies that even at that time, when the church at Philippi help sustain Paul and Thessalonica, other churches could pro properly have had fellowship with Paul in preaching the gospel if they had so desired. Hence, two or more churches, if need be, may cooperate in the work of evangelism. The churches in Galatia, Macedonia, and Achaia gave for the relief of those who were in need in Jerusalem, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. These churches uh, exercised choices in the manner of their giving. They were willing of themselves, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 3, verse 8 and verse 10. The church in Jerusalem, after the conference uh, concerning the question of circumcision, sent Judas and Silas to the church at Antioch, along with Paul and Barnabas, with a letter to help teach the church in Antioch. There's church cooperation in preaching the gospel. If they sent, wrote and sent a letter to another congregation to encourage them to remain faithful and do the work of the Lord... Can I send a, can this congregation send a box of tracts to another congregation to encourage them to remain faithful and, and do the work of the Lord? Exactly. Thus, the New Testament has given these examples of cooperation in the work of evangelism. One church supporting one evangelism, 
one church supporting more than one evangelist and more than one church supporting one evangelist. You know, when Paul said to the Philippians that no one uh, communicated regarding giving and receiving except Philippi, that's an accounting term. Philippi received funds from other congregations and then they sent it on to Paul. That's how Paul could tell the church at Corinth, I robbed other churches so that you wouldn't have to be charged when he preached the gospel to them. That's how Paul robbed other churches, so to speak. One church contributing to more than one church to relieve the needy. More than one church contributing only to one church to relieve the needy. But how best to cooperate? With which church? With which project? All of these are matters of opinion and are left entirely to the decision of the local congregation. Hence, no one should elevate his own opinions to the level of law and divide the body of Christ. This surely is the teaching of scriptures concerning congregational cooperation in doing the Lord's work. Now let's look at some lessons. From this study on Antioism, we draw some important lessons. Number one, in the sphere where God has made specifications, one must heed them. When the Lord gives a command which includes the method, then the method is part of the command. We must do all that the Lord says on any subject, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing different. Number two. When the Lord is, has not legislated, man has no right to legislate. I don't have a right to make a law where God didn't make one. Man errs by adding to God's word in making opinions the law of Christ. It is just as sinful to make matters of opinion, matters of obligation, as it is to make matters of obligation into matters of opinion. In the work of the church, when God has made no specification, Christians should not make them and try to bind them on others. We are to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered under the saints, Jude 3. We are not to contend for our opinions. Number three, <clears throat> when the Lord gives a command without specifying its methodology, then man must discharge it in the best means and methods available to carry out the will of the Lord. Various circumstances and conditions will determine which method is most expedient or advantageous. All who are interested in teaching the gospel and promoting pure New Testament Christianity should keep these rules in mind. The pioneers of the Restoration Movement had a very apt saying which clearly expresses the teaching of the Scriptures. In matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. And in all things, love. Antiism, as it applies to the work of the church, is man making laws where God has not made them and trying to bind them on others to the division of the body of Christ. We must all have the zeal for God, but it must be according to knowledge. Romans chapter 10 and verse 2. Indeed, each follower of Christ must be governed by the Bible, but sometimes... Some people become opinionated and divide congregations completely oblivious to the fact that sound thinking and logical reasoning in harmony with the scriptures would avert the division and strengthen unity in the brotherhood. Knowing and defending the gospel of Christ is of utmost importance. But at the same time, there's no place for harsh, abusive, and, and intemperate words and deeds in connection therewith. For as Paul wrote to Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, 
instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Some, however, seem to find it much easier to denounce those who differ from them than to support their own opinions by the scriptures, reasoning and practice. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Hebrews 13 and verse 1 simply states, let brotherly love continue. Anteism has over the years driven many into the liberal movement. One extreme is just as wrong as the other. Brethren need to be aware that the pendulum can be swung to either end of the spectrum. Loosing where God is bound, ignoring the true pattern God has given us in his word. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. The great threat now to the churches of Christ seems to be not only anism, but to a greater extent liberalism. The churches need to remain true to the teaching of Christ. The times that we live in are critical. Many are departing from the faith. But yet we still have the work of going out and preaching the gospel to every creature. To reach out to the lost, to teach them about Jesus Christ, their Savior. That he died on the cross, was buried, raised the third day, and encouraged them to obey the gospel by repenting by confessing his name and by being baptized in water for remission of their sins, and then to live a faithful Christian life. This morning, if you're subject to the invitation, if you need to be baptized, you need to be restored by repentance and prayer, we encourage you to come forward while we stand and sing.